I have described the virus that leads to the grotesque twisting of the human form into a vampiric predator, living but profoundly altered. I have also described a pathogen that reduces its host to a shambling, decaying husk. Taken on their own, each condition appears quite different, and indeed, while one enhances its host to near superhuman abilities, the other degrades them to a point that they are little more than a walking corpse. In order to understand both the human vampiric virus and the human zombism virus more fully, I knew that after documenting their individual effects, the next logical step was to document their interactions with each other. Now, my valued listener, I will describe my findings in detail, but I must warn you, the ultimate result of this degree of co-infection is, to borrow a phrase, not for the faint of heart. These insidious infections burrow their way into nearly every cell in their host's body, leaving in their wake a creature that is neither human, nor fully vampire, nor fully zombie, but something far more terrifying. While my discovery of the notable zombic pathogen occurred relatively early in my career, the personal journey that led to the discovery and subsequent documentation of the virus that causes vampirism was long and destructive. I have documented many creatures and pathogens previously unknown to science, and though many will likely never become public knowledge, the work that my team and I do, did, is of vital importance. If the average person understood the true depth of the biological threats that lurk just beyond their awareness, well, methods like those I must employ might just seem justified. At least, that is what I tell myself. In any case, utilizing the same, remote, abandoned medical facility in which we conducted our previous studies of co-infected individuals, my research assistant and I once again established secure containment for any participants in this next phase. Securing willing participants for infection with a vampiric virus was surprisingly easy. For a certain demographic, all that was necessary was to present the potential effects, and our pool of willing participants grew easily. In fact, even the possibility of the introduction of the zombic virus did little to dampen some individuals' enthusiasm. And so it was that our study commenced. As I'm sure you understand, it takes a lot of time to find, research, and compile the information explaining the biology of creatures and diseases just like this one. I enjoy the actual process, but often it feels like the digital tools I use to perform this research are fighting against me. Too often I'd find myself fiddling with multiple pieces of software just to stay on top of it all. But all of that changed when I started using Opera Web Browser. Now, you may have heard of Opera before, but if you haven't seen it lately, you'll find that it's packed with features built for modern usability. For example, for subjects like this video, I do a lot of research, reading, and note-taking. I used to have dozens of tabs open, which got to be very overwhelming very quickly. Opera has solved this problem with tab islands, which allow you to separate tabs into different groups and collapse or expand them, which makes organization so much better. In the sidebar, I can even switch between research and personal workspaces, so I can take a break and jump right back in where I left off. And of course, no modern web experience would be complete without AI. But unlike some others, Opera's Aria, as it's called, doesn't feel like an afterthought. It's free, for one thing, and built right into the sidebar, and even better, directly from a command line for quick questions. Personally, I use it all the time to briefly explain or expand on snippets of text right from the context menu, and even translate other languages. When it comes right down to it, these days I need a web browser to do more than just show me websites, and Opera is a one-stop shop. Extension-free ad blocker? Built in. A free and unlimited VPN for privacy and security? It's built in. Chat integration with Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, Telegram, and more so I don't have to have tabs clogging up my window? Built in. I also love the seamless integration with music streaming so I don't have to constantly find the tab I had open just to click next in YouTube Music. There are a ton more thoughtful features that I could go on about, from automatic video sharpening with Lucid Mode to customizable wallpapers, but let's just say that if you're looking for a better way to enjoy content, click the link in the description and check out Opera Web Browser today. Now before I proceed, and though both have been explored in great detail previously, it is worth our time to briefly present the details of both pathogens here. 
beginning with the human vampiric virus, or HVV. HVV is a member of the Mononegavirales order and is an RNA virus that targets a wide range of human cells, with the exception of red blood cells. Upon entry, the virus utilizes a unique strategy, infecting cells through endocytosis and altering their function to produce viral clones without causing immediate cell destruction or lysis. One of the most striking features of HVV is its rapid replication cycle, facilitated by the infection of the thyroid gland and the subsequent increase in metabolic processes throughout the body. This, coupled with an incubation period of a mere 6 to 12 hours, allows the virus to quickly establish itself within the host. As the infection progresses, the host experiences a range of symptoms, from initial flu-like manifestations to the onset of the vampiric coma, a state of active unconsciousness during which the body undergoes a dramatic transformation. This metamorphosis includes elongated canines, enhanced sensory abilities, and a heightened capacity for regeneration, among other changes. But the changes themselves are not entirely for the better. The virus also rewires the host's brain, leading to increased aggression, sensitivity to light, and an insatiable thirst for blood. The human zombism virus is also a member of the Mononegavirales order, and it shares some of HVV's fundamental characteristics. Like HVV, HZV is a single-stranded RNA virus that targets a wide range of human cells. However, HZV's replication strategy differs significantly. While HVV relies on endocytosis and the alteration of host cell function to produce viral clones, HZV utilizes a reverse transcriptase enzyme to produce DNA from its RNA genome. This DNA is then integrated into the host's genome through an integrase enzyme, effectively transforming the infected cell into a factory for new HZV virions. The consequences of this replication strategy are severe, leading to widespread cellular damage, necrosis, and a rapid decline in the host's overall physiological condition. And rather than the relatively slow progression observed in HVV victims, in HZV, symptoms such as aggression, cognitive decline, and physical decay manifest within hours of exposure. Another key difference between the two is the nature of the zombic coma observed in HZV. Unlike the vampiric coma, which is characterized by active unconsciousness and um, metamorphosis, so to speak, the zombic coma is a state of near-complete metabolic shutdown that mimics death. This coma lasts between 4 to 6 hours and is followed by a reanimation phase wherein the individual reawakens with enhanced innervation of skeletal muscle, but a complete loss of humanity. Now, as I briefly touched on in a previous recording, co-infection is a phenomenon in which a host is simultaneously infected with two or more distinct pathogens. In the realm of virology, co-infections can involve viruses from the same family or from entirely different families, each with their own unique characteristics and pathogenic mechanisms. In short, when two or more viruses infect the same host, they may interact in complex ways, leading to synergistic or antagonistic effects on viral replication, immune responses, and disease severity. For this study, I thought it best to begin with two groups, a control group, which were allowed to progress through the stages of HVV infection without intervention, and an experimental group, which were exposed to HZV at a predetermined point before the onset of the vampiric coma. Under strict biocontainment protocols, we introduced HZV to the experimental group via controlled exposure. The subjects were then closely monitored for signs of co-infection, with regular assessments of their vital signs, cognitive function, and physiological state. The results were both fascinating and disturbing. Within a mere two hours of HZV exposure, the experimental group began to exhibit symptoms that deviated sharply from the expected course of early-stage HVV infection. As in normal HVV infection, subjects exhibited rapid onset of high fever, accompanied by severe chills, profuse sweating, and a marked increase in heart rate, some up to 150 beats per minute. Moreover, subjects reported severe thirst despite consuming water at a rate nearly three times higher than the control group. This, of course, was paired with frequent urination, which suggested the rapid onset of metabolic imbalances and potential kidney dysfunction. 
Cognitive impairment followed rapidly, with many subjects experiencing severe confusion, disorientation, and memory loss, with some unable to recognize their surroundings or recall basic personal information. This level of pre-coma cognitive decline was not observed in either the control group or in our previous studies of HVV or HZV infections alone. And in fact, as the co-infection progressed, the increased metabolic activity brought on by the initial HVV infection actually appeared to accelerate the spread of HZV throughout the body. This vicious cycle of viral replication and cellular destruction led to a universally rapid deterioration of the subject's condition. Many developed severe respiratory distress, with oxygen saturation levels dropping below 90%, while neurological symptoms such as seizures and hallucinations became more frequent and intense. Many of the subject's skin took on a mottled, grayish appearance, and numerous lesions and necrotic patches began to develop. But of course, a hallmark of both infections is the rapidly induced comatose state. In HVV, beginning 12 to 24 hours after initial exposure, and 6 to 12 hours in HZV. This state is induced in response to overwhelming metabolic stress. In an effort to cope with the numerous transformative processes brought on by the respective virus, the body's only recourse appears to be to shut down all non-essential functions, including consciousness. Duration of the coma is typically 24 hours and 4 to 6 hours, respectively. All 10 subjects in the experimental group entered into a comatose state within 10 hours of HCV exposure. This coma, which I have termed the hybrid coma, exhibited characteristics of both viruses and was characterized by a profound loss of consciousness accompanied by a significant decrease in metabolic activity and a slowing of vital signs. Subjects regained consciousness, or some semblance thereof, within an average of 18 hours. Upon emergence from the hybrid coma, subjects exhibited an unprecedented range of symptoms and outcomes. Seven individuals exhibited an apparently accelerated progression of both vampiric and zombic traits, with the rapid onset of enhanced sensory abilities and increased strength. Simultaneously, however, they began to show signs of cognitive impairment and a rapidly increasing aggression toward any human in the near vicinity that far outpaced the initial disorientation of HCV or the more gradual hunger of HVV. The final outcome, at least for three specimens, was death. These subjects did not awaken from the coma, instead succumbing to what appeared to be overwhelming systemic failure. The precise cause of this sudden deterioration remains unclear, but at this time, it seems likely to simply be the result of the breakdown of multiple homeostatic mechanisms in response to the competing infections. Of course, observations continued for some time, and the results became even more intriguing. Remarkably, three of the remaining individuals demonstrated a partial resistance to the zombic aspects of HZV. They displayed enhanced physical capabilities and sensory acuity typical of HVV infection, but the expected cognitive decline and necrotic tissue damage associated with HZV were notably absent or significantly delayed. This unexpected resistance appears to have been the result of an unusually robust immune response, as evidenced by the presence of a high number of antiviral cytokines in the specimen's blood. This suggests that while the subject would still suffer from the effects of HVV, the most lethal aspects of HZV might be mitigated. Lifespan in these individuals has so far supported this. Continued observation will be necessary to determine for certain, but it stands to reason that these three individuals may survive for greater than a year. Moving along, two subjects entered a state I have termed unstable hybridization, wherein the subjects oscillated between the behavioral and physical characteristics of their respective infections. Periods of lucidity and enhanced physicality were abruptly interrupted by bouts of aggressive, zombic behavior and visible physical decay. As you might have guessed, these fluctuations posed considerable challenges to containment and care. The precise cause of this oscillation isn't immediately apparent, but it may be driven by episodic changes in the host's metabolic state and influenced by factors such as pre-existing levels of stress, nutrition levels, and circadian rhythms, which may have intermittently favored, for lack of a better word, one virus over the other. This oscillation results in the erratic expression of viral genes, leading to the observed phenotypic instability, as well as significant physiological stress and, over time, systemic damage. 
Ultimately, after emerging from the hybrid coma, these subjects were deceased within an average of 32 days. Two other subjects experienced rapid physical deterioration unlike any observed in the control groups. Their bodies in particular seemed to more deeply manifest the internal struggle of the competing infections, resulting in an accelerated cycle of tissue regeneration and necrosis. Subjects exhibited grotesque physical abnormalities, including rapidly fluctuating muscle mass, erratic bone growths, and extensive dermal lesions the severity of which seems to indicate an overactivation of certain signaling pathways involved in cell growth and death, such as those associated with HVV-induced regeneration and those associated with HZV-induced inflammation and necrosis. The simultaneous activation of these pathways likely leads to conflicting signals within cells, causing chaotic cellular behavior and tissue pathology. It should come as no surprise that this severe physical and metabolic stress reduced lifespan to approximately four days post-coma. The final subject presented a unique case of what could only be described as advanced hybridization. This individual displayed an unprecedented integration of both viral traits, with high physical and sensory enhancements, with minimal cognitive decline, and what appeared to be controlled necrotic progression. Intriguingly, this subject managed to maintain a level of self-awareness and could communicate effectively, albeit with noticeable difficulty. At the time, I believed this to be nothing more than a novel form of viral symbiosis, wherein HVV's enhancements compensated for HZV's degenerative effects, essentially leading to a state of relative balance and allowing the subject to function semi-normally. While there was certainly some truth to this, it wasn't until phase three that I would begin to truly understand what was happening here, at even the genetic level, but I'm getting ahead of myself. We will return to this discussion in due time. For now, allow me to provide the record of what came next. The second phase of our study was designed to observe the effects of zombic infection in subjects with established vampiric traits specifically those who had already undergone the vampiric coma and emerged as fully transformed vampires. Test subjects were easily recruited from the previous control group who were infected for at least six months and had fully adapted to their new vampiric physiology. I should note here that while, of course, locating these individuals was a matter of ease, persuading them to join in this effort was another thing altogether. In any case, as before, subjects were divided into two groups, a control group, which would continue to live as vampires without any intervention, and an experimental group, which would be exposed to the human zombism virus. Within the first 24 hours of HZV exposure, the experimental group began to exhibit symptoms that were distinct from both their established vampiric baseline and the typical progression of HZV infection in humans. And the results, as should likely be expected by now, were both intriguing and disturbing. One of the most striking initial symptoms in these subjects was a rapid onset of physical pain. Subjects reported intense burning sensations throughout their bodies, particularly in their small muscle groups and joints. This pain was apparently so severe that many were unable to move or even stand, a stark contrast to the usual vampiric strength and agility. Now, in traditional zombic infections, as mentioned in my direct study, it is unlikely that pain is perceived strongly. As the senses degrade, it is likely that victims of this infection feel a chronic aching sensation, but the loss of higher brain function limits the interpretation of severe pain signals. The effects of the vampiric virus, however, counteract much of this nerve blunting and appear to prolong higher brain function. As a result, the subjects in this group experienced severe discomfort likely stemming from joint inflammation, myositis, nerve tissue destruction, and various necrotic processes. Because of this, several subjects were at last sedated in an attempt to relieve their suffering. But this discomfort was only exacerbated by profound hunger and thirst. Despite having fed on blood just prior to HZV exposure, each subject reported an insatiable craving for both blood and flesh, with no apparent distinctive preference. Indeed, it appears that HZV-induced damage to the hypothalamus disrupts the process of hunger signaling, leading to an indiscriminate feeding pattern, a far cry from the selective sanguivory of traditional vampires. Worse, this indiscrimination is paired with the frenzied aggression observed in zombies, entirely devoid of the calculated hunting strategies seen in vampirism. 
autopsies revealed another possible explanation for this altered feeding pattern. The stomach and intestines exhibited severe necrosis, which presumably limited the subject's ability to process blood effectively. As the infection progressed, and as with the previous phase, the subject's skin, which had previously been pale and smooth, took on a grayish, mottled appearance. Necrotic lesions and patches of decaying flesh began to appear, particularly around the site of HCV exposure. Cognitive and behavioral changes were equally concerning. Subjects routinely exhibited periods of extreme confusion, disorientation, and memory loss, struggling to recall even basic information. These cognitive impairments were punctuated by bouts of intense aggression and rage, with subjects lashing out at both their surroundings and each other. In terms of senses, in 92% of the experimental group, visual acuity was substantially diminished as ocular tissues were compromised by HZV, and the same was true of hearing, though the sense of smell appeared to actually surpass that of the control group. Blood samples and tissue biopsies taken from the experimental group indicated an increasingly higher viral load of HZV relative to HVV over time. This seems to indicate that HZV's more aggressive infection strategy is superior, at least in terms of replication, than that of HVV, and in short, the zombic virus appeared to disrupt the delicate balance HVV had achieved in maintaining its own dominance within the victim. Even so, the established presence of HVV within the subject's cells did appear to modulate the progression of HZV infection in some unique ways. For example, rather than inducing lysis in all cases, the presence of HZV in the cells more commonly resulted in a state of cellular dysregulation. It appears that mitochondrial function, which HVV had enhanced in order to support the vampiric physiology, began to deteriorate, leading to decreased energy production and increased oxidative stress. At the tissue level, this cellular dysregulation manifested as a kind of tension between regeneration and decay. Some areas of the subject's bodies, particularly those with a high concentration of HVV-infected cells, appeared to resist the destructive effects of HZV, maintaining a semblance of vampiric integrity. Other areas, however, succumb to the aggressive spread of HZV. I suspect this variance to be the result of viral tropism, as well as the varying strengths of localized immune responses in the varying tissues. Due to the compounded physiological strain and systemic breakdown caused by the two viruses' competing mechanisms, the life expectancy of subjects co-infected with HVV and HZV is drastically reduced, ranging from a few weeks to several months post-infection, and significantly shorter than what might be expected from an HVV infection alone. The final cause of death in these subjects was accelerated organ failure and eventual complete systemic collapse. While the effects observed in the first two phases were equal parts distressing and enlightening, a good portion of what we documented was, in a way, expected. But in the process of our observations, and as our sample sizes grew, an entirely unexpected result began to appear more and more frequently. I alluded to it briefly in my recounting of the first phase, but little did I know then just how insidious this particular co-infection would prove to be. I must take a brief intermission, my valued listener, but when I return, I will explain these findings in detail. For now, suffice it to say that what this co-infection produced was, I believe, a novel form of viral evolution, and it was occurring right before our eyes. This video was made possible by Opera, and by viewers like you. Thank you, and remember, you matter.